Good morning. I want to welcome all of those, the other campuses joining us this morning, as well as those of you joining us online. My name is Stu. I am the campus pastor at Arcade Campus of Crosstown, and we're glad you've joined us today. Let me just start out by telling you I am a big fan of the Olympics. I love the Olympics. I love to watch the athletes compete, and, I, and how awesome would it be to be able to compete in a jersey that says USA on it, right? Um, many of you probably don't know this, but I was an athlete in school, and actually back in the day, I was invited to play for a U.S. national team, an under-17 soccer team. And yeah, so that was then, but this is now. I don't look much like that guy that can play for a national team right now. Um, and that got me thinking about athletes that don't necessarily look like athletes anymore. Uh, it reminded me of that movie, if you've ever seen Napoleon Dynamite. And if you have not seen that movie, you have not missed a thing. Trust me. That is three hours of my life I'll never get back. But, um, but if you have seen the movie, then you're aware, you know this guy, uh, Napoleon's Uncle Rico, right? Everybody knows Uncle Rico. He's a guy who constantly talked about his high school football career and, and the glory days and claims he could have gone pro if only he'd have been given the chance. Um, he's far from his days of being an actual athlete, but he's, he's one by name only. Um, and while we're thinking about movies, I, I got thinking about Captain America. If you remember Captain America before he saved the world, right? If you remember in the beginning of the movie... Captain America wasn't even a real soldier. He was this guy who, who wore a superhero costume, and he went around selling war bonds, trying to raise money. But he wasn't even a real soldier. Kind of like claiming to be something, but really being in name only. Like this light bulb. Take this light bulb. If it doesn't light up, is it really a light bulb? Not really. I mean, Jesus is known as the light of the world. If we're followers of Christ, then we should look like Christ. We should be a light in the world also. If you go back to the Greek translation of Christians, it actually is translated little Christ. We should look like Christ. The problem is, when we don't look like Christ, we don't represent an, a an accurate picture of who he is to the world. We're going to continue our study in Philippians. So if you want to turn to me to chapter 2, and we've been talking about finding our joy. What better way to find your joy than to look like Christ? So we're going we're gonna to see, I think you're going to find in this passage that we're going to study today, that there's really four things in this passage that we need to do to look like Christ. And, and so I want to talk about those, and then I want to give an application for each of those items so that you can live a life that looks a little bit more like Jesus. So we're, gonna, we're going to chapter 2 of Philippians, and we might as well start right in the beginning, right? So let's start with, chat, with verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. So it's in this passage right here that we find the first thing that we're called to do to look like Christ. And that is to protect the unity of the church. We see it right there at the end of verse 2. It says, being in full accord and of one mind. So we're, we're supposed to be together. How do we do this in our life? How do we put this into practice? I think the first part of verse 3 really tells us how to do it. It says in that first part of verse 3, it says, do nothing out of self, from selfish ambition or conceit. If we're going to avoid this, then we need to know what's this look like? What's this selfish ambition look like? Well, we see that in that person who's always looking out for themselves. Maybe it's that person that's climbing the corporate ladder, right? working their way to the top, 
And, and they're always working hard to make sure they make the right decisions, to impress the right people, you know, to do all the right things so that they can move up corporate chain. They may say, you know, hey, I may have to bend a few rules, maybe hurt a few people, but, you know, that's the cost of doing business, right? No, <laughs> that's selfish ambition. And that may seem like an extreme example, although it may not be such a foreign thought to some here in this room. But how about some other things maybe that are selfish ambition as well? How about when it comes to having a meal with people? Are you the first to get, get your food so that you get the good stuff? So you get what you want? Or do you think about others and make sure that they have their first choice of what they want? Or how about that person that, that guns the throttle to pull out in front of somebody, you know, just so you can be 50 yards or so ahead of them on the road? This is the idea of selfish ambition or conceit. It's, it's thinking about my wants and my desires over someone else. It's the me first mentality that is so prevalent in our world today. Here's the problem. In this verse, we are called to be united, all in one accord. This can't happen with that me first mentality. When I'm worried about me first and what people think of me and my successes, and you are worried about you first and what people think about you and your successes, then what's best for the whole church it's not even on our radar. It can't be. We can't, be cons we can't look out for and be concerned about the church when we're so busy looking out for ourselves, looking out for us. If you want an example of what it's supposed to look like, just look at our Savior Jesus Christ in the garden. You know, He said, and I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit, Hey, Dad, do you have a plan B? You know, I'd really like to not have to do this whole cross thing. You know, maybe we could come up with a, a different way and now would be a great time to maybe think of that. But what does he say? Thy will be done. Your will, not mine. He said, you know, I don't really want to do this, but I'm willing to put my hopes and my desires aside. And I'll think of others before myself. I'll endure the pain and the shame and the agony for them. That's the opposite of doing things for selfish ambition. So what's the application? How do we do this? How do we do this in regular life? I don't think many of us are called to the cross, right? So how do we do this in everyday life? Well, I would say the best way to do this is to put yourself aside and to serve others. Now, this is an application that some of you, you may have already done. You can just check this off as already done. You've already done that. Um, but let me encourage, if, if Crosstown is your church home and you agree with the vision here, then why not be part of the team? Why not step up and serve? On our information wall in the foyer at all our campuses, you'll find a ministry menu. And this has the different ministries listed along with who oversees that ministry and their contact information. Um, let me encourage you to step up and join a serve team. Check out that list. See what on there. Hey, you know what? I'm good at this area. I'm gifted. I could do that. Then contact that person and step up and join a serve team. It's a great time to start right now. We have outreaches coming up at most of our campuses, and, and it's a great way to be unified and all working together to grow Christ's church. When I think of unity, I picture a team of horses or oxen, and they're pulling in the same direction, right? What would happen if one of those horses decides it wants to go this way and the other one wants to go this way? They wouldn't accomplish much, would they? No, they need, to have, they need to put their own desires aside 
and they need to pull in the same direction. If we want to be a church that's unified and pulling in the same direction, then we need to put others first on a regular basis. And when we do that, our light shines and we look a little bit more like Christ. Going on, the next thing that we have to do, verse 3 continue on, continues with a similar thought, and that's the idea that we need to embrace the humility of Christ. The end of verse 3 going on says, But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What is humility? Well, Webster defines it as freedom from pride or arrogance. Yeah, that kind of helps. But honestly, I think C.S. Lewis has a much better description as he describes it in this quote. He says, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Those are words we could live by. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Thinking of yourself less. We need to embrace the humility of Christ. Well, what does that humility of Christ look like? It's described for us in the next few verses. Starting at verse 5, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now before we go on, we need to slow down and think about those words that we just read. This Jesus, who himself is God. I mean, he was there when the world was created. Everything that we know, he was there when it was created. He has his hand on everything that occurs, not just in our lives, but around the world as well. He is above all things and is Lord and Savior, and he, desires, he deserves to be worshipped at all times. This same Jesus humbled himself. He thought of us first, and he left the glory of heaven to come to earth to take on the form of a man. And not like a king or, or some other leader, but he came as the son of a carpenter, a man that had to be born in a stable to an unwed mother. And if that was not enough, he lived a life here on earth of continually serving others. Does that sound like the life that he deserved? Absolutely not. Because he willingly set it aside what he did deserve and he put others first and he humbly left the beauty and splendor of heaven. I mean, think about it. Heaven is described as having streets of gold. Think about what the rest of heaven must look like if they use gold for pavement. It's amazing to think. And yet Jesus humbly left it all to come to earth. And that would be big enough if he came to earth as a king, but he didn't. He did it. In fact, he came as a servant. We see it so clearly in the Last Supper. We see this humility. Let me set the scene for you. Okay, They're preparing for what we call the Last Supper. They're preparing for the Passover meal. And, um, and some of the disciples have had a discussion, which is kind of funny, about who's the greatest among them. <laughs> and Jesus answers it by this. You see, in those days... If you were going to an event, an outing, a meal, or something, you would you go get cleaned up. Well, you'd go to the public baths and you'd bathe, and you'd get clean, and then you'd put on good clothes, you know, so you look nice, and then you put your sandals on your feet. But they walked everywhere they went. So remember, it's hot. It's hot there. They're walking around in sandals on dusty roads, in which. Donkeys and other animals had left presents, let's say, in the road, right? Um, I'm going to guess 
that their feet were dirty, were sweaty, and disgusting. And it was always the lowest servant's job in the house to wash the feet of the guests. Now when Jesus realized, remember, this same holy, amazing Jesus who was their creation, when he realized that the disciples weren't willing to do it, he chose to take the role of the lowest servant in the house and he humbled himself to that point and he washed the disciples' feet. And you know, I don't think it was just a ceremonial thing. My guess is their feet stunk. But Jesus, he humbled himself and he took on this role. Have you ever had someone wash your feet? Or have you ever washed somebody else's feet? Pretty humbling. Can you imagine how humbling it is when you're not willing to do a job, but the Savior of the world steps in and does it for you? That is humility. That is thinking of others before yourself. Yeah, we see humility in Christ and what he did, but what do we see in the world today? Sometimes I think what we see in the world is much more like what we saw in the disciples. We see things like pride. Now, it's not necessarily that, that arrogant look at me type, you know. Uh, we may see that some, but I think it's much less often because it's, it's way more obvious. The pride that I'm talking about is usually a lot more subtle. Kind of sneaks in there. We don't always see it. One form of pride might be that person that doesn't want to clean the toilet or vacuum or, or you know, shovel snow or do some of those, take out the garbage. You know, often we tell ourselves it's because we have more important things to do. Realistically, I think often it's because deep down inside, we're too proud to lower ourselves to do such jobs. Or maybe it's something even a little bit more subtle, but, but pride shows up in so many, so many different areas. Uh, it could be, you know, that person that, that they, they're not really teachable. Nobody can teach them anything because, well, I already knew that. You're the kind of person that hears yourself saying that, oh, I knew that, I already knew that. You see yourself say that a lot? Maybe you need to take a look in the mirror. That pride? Or maybe it's that person that says, man, I can't believe what, what Dustin did. Boy, I'd never do that if I was a Christian. Did you hear what so-and-so did? I'd never do that. Pride. Pride shows up in a multitude of ways. But humility comes when we live our lives that look like Jesus. One way that we can show humility and the application that I would say for this week that I want to give you, one way to show humility is to do the work of a servant. Be a servant. I'm challenging you this week to do three random acts of kindness for people when you're expecting nothing in return. You know, you could maybe take a meal or take some cookies or something to a coworker. Or, or to a friend or somebody you know that's in need. You could leave an encouraging note for your postal worker or for your garbage man. Maybe leave a little gift for them. Uh, pray for the person behind the window in the drive through Or here's one. Here's a challenging one for you. Maybe when you go in to use that public restroom, that's not really the cleanest you could actually spend some time cleaning up that restroom so it's ready for the next person. When we do things like that, we look a little bit more like Christ and our light shines a little bit brighter for him. The third way that we can look like Christ is that we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling. As we continue on, we get to verse 12, and it says, Therefore, my beloved, 
as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Sometimes when I, when I look at the way some Christians look at God, and they look at this you know, as a, as a warm, fuzzy God, approachable and welcoming and accessible, and don't get me wrong, God is all those things, right? God is all those things. But then when I look at that and I compare that to how some of our more religious friends look at God as holy, as other, as unapproachable, and I think that maybe sometimes we could learn a little something from that. This idea of working out your salvation with fear and trembling reminds us that we need to approach God with reverence. He is perfect and holy and the creator of the universe, and because of all that, he needs to be approached in that way. I think of a teacher that I had in high school. He was my Latin teacher, and I had him for four years. Yes, I took four years of Latin. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but I remember seeing him years later, and when we were chatting, and I had graduated years ago, and uh, he said to me, you know, you've been out of school for many years. You know you can call me Bob, right? And I just kind of nodded. Mm -hmm. But you know, a few years ago, he passed away. And I went to the funeral home for the visitation. And even as I've gotten older and became an adult, he has always been Mr. Wood. Not because I didn't know his first name, but because he had earned the respect of being called Mr. Wood. If this man who was human, and he was far from perfect, if he had earned that, how much more? Does our creator, the creator of the universe, how much more does he earn my honor and my respect as well? We should have some, some healthy fear of God. Yes, he's approachable, but there's a way to do it. And it's done with a certain amount of respect and a certain amount of fear and trembling. So what's the application? How do we put this into our regular life? Well, I think we need to pursue holiness. We need to, to prepare our hearts to meet with God. Today and every day. When you read your Bible, when you come to church, when you're going to small group, take time to ask God to reveal things in your heart that you need to make right. You know, we need to purify ourselves before meeting with him. We just talked about how before having a meal, they would take a bath and they would prepare themselves and then they would wash their feet to prepare. What do we need to wash in our lives before we meet with the Lord of the universe? And then we need to deal with those things. We need to pursue holiness. We need to get to a point where we view sin in the same way that God does. We have to hate sin as much as he does. I'm just going to tell you, you can't be watching pornography on Saturday night and then expect to have a wonderful time of worship on Sunday morning. You can't be actively sinning over here and then expect somehow when you come through those doors that your, your heart is magically changed and so you're ready and you're in the right mind to worship God. It doesn't work that way. We need to work in conjunction with the Holy Spirit to pursue holiness. Now I understand that we're all in different places in our walk, in our faith, and, and I totally understand that, but just like Pastor Jeremy said a couple weeks ago, even though we're at different places in our walk, we can't be content where we're at. We need to strive we need to, to, to continue to grow in our faith. And one of the ways in which we do that is by pursuing holiness. And when we pursue holiness, our light gets a little brighter 
and we look a little bit more like Jesus. Fourth thing we need to do is we need to live life without grumbling or complaining. <laughs> Paul sums up this section and, and how we're supposed to do these things, and he, and he does it in verse 14 and continuing. He says, verse 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. In this world, I think grumbling and, and complaining have surpassed baseball and become our national pastime, right? And you know what? We're good at it. We're really good at it. If it was an Olympic sport, we would win gold every time. This world is full of armchair quarterbacks. And you know what? I'm no different. Caught myself doing that here just recently. I was watching the Olympics, and, and get this, I was watching fencing. Now let me tell you, my knowledge of fencing is probably less than zero, okay? I, I, I think the, thing, the sword thing that they use is called a foil, and I was amazed when I realized, I, I'm like, why are they tied in there? Why is there a rope connected to a chain? I found out they're tethered, because of the electronic scoring. And so that's how they know when the person actually stabs them or whatever they call it. Um, so that's what I know about fencing. But if you saw any of this, you might, be, you might have been doing the same thing. If you saw any of this, the American team was doing really well, and they had a great lead. And then they switched to a different person, which I guess they do every so many points, if I understand it, right? <clears throat> and this different lady comes up. And I don't even know her name, which further reveals my knowledge of fencing. Um, but this different lady steps up, and so she's fencing, trying to stab the lady, and she's not doing really good. And the other team starts coming back. So here I am complaining about this and telling her what she's doing wrong and what she should do, right? Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? But that's what we naturally do. We think that our way is the right way. And if people would just do things the way we want, then they'd have much more success, right? And if we're not able to actually tell the person, then we make sure that we tell the people around us so that they can be amazed by our wonderful knowledge and how much we know. Now, Olympic fencing is probably not really something worth grumbling and complaining. But some things are. There are some things in this world that are worth complaining about. Seeing that girl that's going into the abortion clinic for an abortion. Or seeing a child that's being mistreated. Or maybe that child that's hungry. They don't have any food or any other sort of real problem that we have in this world, much more important than fencing. What if we use that energy, rather than, rather than grumbling and complaining, and we actually put it to good use? What if we maybe decided to see something and it bothered us, and so we decided to volunteer at a local crisis pregnancy center? or maybe volunteer at a homeless shelter, or, or give to the food pantry, or whatever the answer is to the problem that we're complaining about. Why don't we do something about it? The natural response in the world is to grumble and complain. But we're not called to be like the world. So here's the application for this passage. Here's the application of this section. What are you supposed to do? I want you to refocus your energy. This week, when you see something, you see a real problem, probably more important than fencing, but when you see a real problem or a real need in our society and you're getting ready to grumble, stop and find a way to offer assistance. Find some way 
to make a positive difference in that situation. And when we do that, our light shines a little brighter and we look a little bit more like Christ. You see, when we, when we look like Christ, we can make a difference. We can shine like a light in a dark world. And the darker it is, the brighter our light seems to shine. Let me tell you about a time when our world was dark and was in need of light. And the actions of just a few Christians had a worldwide impact. So the year is A.D. 250, and there's a plague had spread into the, the mighty Roman Empire. Not only had it spread there, it took the empire to its knees. Now there's no records of exactly how many people died during this at this time, but it's reported that at the height of the pandemic, between 250 and 262 A.D., as many as 5,000 people died daily in Rome. Yes, you heard that right. 5,000 a day in Rome alone. It's reported that the population of Alexandria dropped from 500,000 to 190,000 people during the pandemic. The number of lives lost was astronomical, and, and really nearly everyone was, infe- was affected in some way. And like many times in the past, when something like this happens, We like to look for a group to blame. Whose fault is it? Who can we blame? In the beginning, this group was the Christians. The Romans would say, you know what? It's the Christians' fault. They've they've angered the gods. That's little g gods, by the way. They've angered the gods by not worshiping them. So it's their fault. That's why we're all sick and dying. And that was the general consensus. But then, their perception of the Christians changed. Began to change. Why? What happened? You see, during the pandemic, anyone who was not infected would either hide in their homes, which was effective for a few, or more likely, they'd just leave. They'd get out. Get out of the city, get out, get away from people. They would go. But when they did that, they left those that were sick and dying there. And they, there was no one to take care of them. Can you imagine how that must have felt to be that person and to watch your loved ones just leave you with nobody there to care for you and you're going to be sick and die alone? Or to be that family member that was so worried about being infected that they had to leave and they left their loved ones to die alone. They were so afraid to be infected that they would do anything they could not to. But it's in this dark place there came a flicker of hope. This guy named Cyprian, who was a bishop in the church at the time, And he preached a message to the people that in this dark time, they needed to step up and show love and compassion. Remember, these are the same people who are blaming them for causing the pandemic. And he's saying, no, we need to love them. We need to show compassion on them. We need to take care of them. And that's what they did. While the rest of the world ran away, they stayed and they were the light of Jesus in a world that desperately needed to know him. And you know what? The world noticed. The way that the Christians stayed and took care of the sick and the dying, it became widespread. And it was arguably one of the greatest times of growth in the church. The Christians there, they saw adversity as an opportunity. And their actions had a huge impact on the world. As a Christian, 
We can't afford to have a pretend faith. We can't just look the part, but have no real faith. We can't live in the glory days of like a high school athlete from yesteryear. You can't talk about what your faith used to be. We have to strive to continually be like him. Or else our light will continually go dim. But you know what? The darker our world gets, in contrast, our light will shine brighter still. I'd like to invite the worship team forward as I close us in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you have called us to be like your son. You've called us to to live a life that looks like Christ. And that in that, we can find joy by seeking you. Father, give us the strength, the ability, give us the opportunities to shine our light for you, that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.